my name is Ed Ko. Uh, I'm the director of uh, Foundation Program. Um, I'm just so the in this discussion, I'm mostly just driving the uh, conversation. Right. I'm I'm also learning as well. So hopefully, I'll be asking questions for the audience here. Right. That's my role in here. So introducing our panelists. Um, so we have Hugh Hubert. Uh, oh right here and uh right and he's he's a lead map painter at image engine and as you can see on the screen that his credit includes uh many film that i'm sure many of you have have seen have heard of um and we also have my case here uh whose credit actually includes a lot of very very popular games right? including um i think there's the uh need for speed uh as well as the what was the shooting uh game you heartland uh, was it i worked on a, a battlefield game oh yeah battlefield yeah right so so hopefully you guys are very excited right about maybe they'll share some internal tips uh, about their experiences as well. Um, and so unfortunately, we other our other panelists uh, might be a little late uh, for this. So we'll start right away, right? This is a ongoing conversation. Uh, we'll just keep talking. And so we'll, we'll start with a very simple question is, what is light? Um, and we all have a very direct experience with light, right? Every single one of us, uh, we understand the light as right the sunlight. Uh, every day we turn on and off light switch, but for most of us, that's kind of where our experience with light kind of hit the wall, right? That's our day to day experience. But uh, as you guys will probably see, is light is probably one of the most powerful tool. Uh, for artists. So maybe I'll direct this question to uh, Hubert is what is lighting or what is light in general? Oh boy, <laughs> what a great question. I see some, some uh, Robert wrote on the little chat here that he's coming from a cinematographer point of view. And just to um, echo that a little bit, I guess that's how I understand it more. You know, I'm a environment artist, mash, map painter more specifically, um, I guess. And, uh, you know, there's not that much painting and mud painting anymore. So it's uh, much more based on photography. So, so at least from the VFX perspective, uh, lighting comes from the camera. At least that's how I see it in my day-to-day -day, uh, life, uh, matching the footage, matching the camera, and matching whatever the camera sees and mm -hmm. whatever the camera sees well that comes from the cinematographer i guess or the director or whoever's on set um so that's how i i, I sort of that's how I, I navigate lighting scenarios um but obviously i think from the foundation perspective in the class that we're teaching on, 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 on at school um we try to take an approach that is quite physical so, you know, photons, <laughs> uh, energy, uh, direct, indirect lighting. Uh, so this is sort of how I sort of approach it in the class. And I know that Ed is teaching a lot of foundation classes that are much more um, um, sort of, uh, <clears throat> you know, classic painting or digital and, 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 and analog painting. So, your approach might be a, a little bit different from your day to day, mm. but at the end of the day, I think that's not, maybe that's where this discussion is hopefully gonna go. Um, but yeah, what is right? Light? Yeah, and, energy, and, uh, energy. That's what it is. Energy, and and yeah. would that uh, would that connect with you, uh, Mike? As right, so for you, I think games, uh, it's almost coming from the other side of um the film almost right you're almost constructing yeah. a world 
and then the player get to experience whereas uh we right for films you bring a lot of existing world uh into the process uh how would you describe right from from your to you like what is lighting right if if you get asked this question by a student yeah uh actually we just dealt with this in one of my environment classes um coming from the game side like you said we're more you know we're starting from nothing it's almost like you know in cinematography if you're shooting inside of a sound stage you start with nothing right like you black out all the lights and then start adding your light in to control everything um i try to teach them that lighting is synonymous with game design because you have to guide the player on this interactive experience and the way you guide them is you know trying to show them if you try and force it with you know fakery and trickery it's not going to work as well as if you create a much more organic sort of living environment the nice thing is is i've been in this game a long time and i've seen we used to have not very powerful hardware and so trying to play in the same space as film and television and stuff was impossible for us uh, but now we've gotten to the point where hardware has caught up we can we can use a lot of trickery that we've developed over the years as well as you know doing things like real-time ray tracing in order to try and get as close to that real world experience as possible and even if we're not doing photorealistic rendering it's really important to have proper lighting proper shadow it's like I said, it is very much synonymous with game design because that's how we kind of craft our experiences. If you've played a game that's got, you know, bad lighting, it can ruin really great environment art, really great, you know, uh, design. Uh, think about playing like, a, you know, a horror game that's got poor lighting. Think about playing a, an action adventure game, whether you're playing, you know, something like a Red Dead Redemption or a Grand Theft Auto these worlds are only as good as their lighting artists and their art direction so let me so let me uh so those are i think excellent point which we'll circle back on and dive into more details um i think to me uh from a very basic point of view is maybe to really figure out like what do you mean by uh good and bad lighting maybe we can talk about um uh, what's a very common source of light right and what's uh to you and especially when now you have experience with students is uh maybe there's light sources that most people when they start they don't think about them as light source, right? As something that will affect the light in the scene, in the shot. Um, maybe, and especially I think uh, we'll go to you, Hubert, is you have to match these lights, right? You have some, you have light that is taken maybe outdoor, and then maybe you have light that's taken indoor. Uh, what do you think is some of the most common light and and what are some of the lights that uh, maybe beginners don't realize they are also light source? Mm, yeah, that's also a good point, a, a good question. And a couple of things that Michael's, Michael mentioned about light uh, is also super interesting, like light as a storytelling device. Uh, maybe he mentioned that maybe a little bit. Um, well, I'm trying to answer your question, obviously, you know, and, and matte painting, at least in, in my world, uh, environments are very much synonymous with some of, well, close to these two pictures that we can see on screen right now. So, you know, outside landscapes. Um, so that's a little bit our bread and butter most of the time, you know, um, a lot of discussions about skies, types of skies, hazing, now the rest of the stuff, I guess, we're a little bit dependent on the footage, unless um, unless we're doing something that's full CG. Then we're going more into the world that Michael was mentioning, where everything is sort of created from scratch. Although in the VFX industry, we're sort of like codependent on the edit, you know, matching to 
what happens after and before the story, you know, what time of day are we? Um, are we inside or outside? Uh, you know, I would say most of the time we would sort of matte paint something that's outside. Um, so we're talking about moonlight and sunlight. So one source of lighting and then just talking about its different variations of, you know, time of day, time of year, um, direction of the viewer, uh, hazing, uh, you know, humidity, uh, and then shadow color, direct color. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that would be, I guess, the main thing that, that, that we would do, especially for outside scenes, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I, I enjoy the most, maybe, you know, landscapes. Are always fun and then and then you obviously jump into extensions that have to match an artificial lighting on the set so um then it, it, it might get a little bit more complex where you have multiple sources of light like street lamps or or even even worse you know artificial sources of light placed on set to 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 um attract the attention on the actors which is something that tends to happen in movies. And then very more, more often than not, this is cheated, right? So it makes no real sense in real life. And I guess maybe that's when we're linking with video games, sometimes we cheat something to attract our attention to, to uh, you know, a storytelling for the game or storytelling for the movie. And I guess storytelling is the most important part of what we do. So, and light is, is, is just, a tool and it's one of the most important tools i guess because that's what shapes the world we look at without it it's black right um and just to echo what, what michael was saying i guess for the movie industry um i would tend to agree that lighting is much more important than even your set um you know you can have a not so well designed or defined textures or models but if your lighting is interesting and it sort of works just because it shapes the world uh, in an interesting matter and same thing on set you know you have a nice lighting scenario and you don't pay attention to the fact that everything is made out of cheap styrofoam you know uh, so so the lighting is just a just a fantastic tool to um, uh, yeah to 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 shape the world that you look at yeah, so Mike, you want to follow on that, right? From your angle, in my... I'm, yeah, I was going to say, I, I would echo everything you said in terms of, you know, um, trying to make sure that students understand, you know, that light bounces, that it's not completely static, that, um, for example, like for anybody who's seen uh, Kong versus Godzilla, right? Like the, the scenes that take place in Hong Kong, where it's nighttime and there's neon everywhere and there's a fight scene going on. So it's like super, you know, high contrast or very busy, very hard to sort of like follow some of the action. We have that too, you know, in games and just trying to manage that. Uh, light emitting surfaces like, you know, neon, um, volumetric uh, light, like, you know, just the simplest thing of just like, it's nighttime, there is a street lamp, and there's just a little bit of particles, you know, hanging in the air, or the air is a little bit more dense, and you're getting that, you know, the little god rays and the volume light, and just something small and subtle like that can be hugely powerful when you're setting up a scene. Um, you know, one of the, the assignments that I give students is to basically paint with light and shadow and show me a particular object in a scene, right? Like a MacGuffin, you know, like a treasure chest or whatever. And one of the easiest ways, like one of the cheapest cheats is, you know, using a street lamp with a little bit of volume light gives you basically just a, a straight up cone showing you exactly what it is that you want them to see. Hold on, we got loud dogs in the back. Uh, getting attacked by some canine monsters <laughs> right you're, so you were saying about Kong versus Godzilla <laughs> have a, another participant in the fight um great so um so let's jump from I think the idea to kind of 
the practicals a little bit is kind of talk about maybe personally, right? You working in the industry, in the studios. Um, what what's it like to you know encounter light? So do you take right? So Hubert, you mentioned right taking uh, photos from photographers. Uh, what you look at, at uh, how you need to figure out how to deal with it. Um, maybe go right, go from the angle of uh, maybe is there like a project that gives you the most difficulty, right? And if uh, if there is a different or the same project that gives you um, the most satisfaction from completing it. Well, I'm gonna sort of start with some of the images I see on screen and the, the, the green screen one, I guess it's always a tricky one because um, you try to, especially, especially trying to uh, give the impression of outside lighting in a confined studio space like that. Um, and then you're on set and there's no context. So everything is green as we can see in this image. And then we're trying to recreate that. Well, the director of photography is trying to recreate, let's say, an outside scene here. And there is no context for the outside. Everything is green. And, you know, the best thing you can try to do is obviously establish a strong key light. So main light source, let's say the sun. Um, but first of all, it's never going to be as strong or as far away as the sun is. The shadows are never going to match. And then the other problem is the intricate secondary lights or the bounce lights, which are so complex in the real world. And obviously, uh, renderers are getting better and better and quite, quite amazing now with trying to match that complexity in terms of secondary bounce lights. Um, this is something that I think on set, on a green screen set, does not yet work. Um, I mean, the bigger the set, the better it's going to be, uh, obviously, because you have much more room, but you're usually confined in the space. Uh, you're, when you're placing your cameras, you don't necessarily know where your horizon is. So the way you frame usually is cheated. Your lighting is cheated. And then you get that into the VFX world. So on our machines in the studios, and we're trying to recreate uh, the vastness of an uh, outside environment, let's say, but we're also confined to, the, to matching the lighting of the set. So you're stuck in between two worlds now, and this is the challenge. You try to sell the vastness of the environment, so you're trying to make it seem like we're outside, um, but at the same time, you sort of have to match to what's happening on a green screen photography. And then it's that balance, you know, it's like trying to create that vastness, which I guess digitally would be easier if you weren't confined to this sort of uh, artificial light, green screen, confined environment. And that usually, I think that's the biggest challenge. And I, I think we're solving some of these issues when we move to the last image with the Mandalorian, where the sets are now not green screen anymore. Now we're actually physically projecting uh, the sky on screens in the back. And we get much more natural secondary bounce lights. Um, and yeah, so I guess that, that would be the biggest challenge, you know, to, to, to try to give, <laughs> give the impression of, of outside lighting uh, when you're confined to a green screen set with, with, with artificial lighting on the green screen set. Yeah. I mean, so it, it definitely and you see it in movies, sounds, sorry. Yeah. You see it, you always see it in movies like something's not working here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds like so I think this is a perfect way to kind of direct the same question to Mike is the difficulty you encounter is very physical based. It's almost like uh, it's your limit right that the difficulty you try to merge is in the physical space and where i would imagine uh, the almost the opposite is true for the gaming space where you're more limited by your kind of the digital 
kind of capacity to to render stuff, right? To create new light, adding in. You're trying to optimize taking out. Yeah, I mean, for for us, we're always more fighting the technology. We're always more just fighting, like, what can we do? What can we fit in the the limited amount of CPU resources, GPU resources, RAM, right? Like, how fast can we fill a frame buffer? When you're dealing in like a film or television production environment, when you hit that render button, you walk away a couple hours later, you've got a couple of frames. Game players are now expecting 4K resolution running at 60 frames a second, you know, on their $500 gaming console. They're expecting 120 frames per second at 4K on their gaming PCs. So how do we deliver film quality experiences at insane speeds, right? So we have to make a lot of compromises and a lot of cheats to get our lighting working the way that it should. Um, a lot of the times for production, you end up having a tech director and an art director just constantly yeah. bashing and butting heads all the time because the art director wants it to be the most beautiful, the most perfect, the most amazing looking thing ever. And the tech director is saying that's cool, but it's still a video game and we need to be able to play it. So you have this constant struggle for resource management. Yeah. Um, Again, we're, we've been blessed that we're constantly getting this like faster and faster and faster hardware, but we're still cheating, right? Like real time, full on, beautiful, perfect lighting. We're still not there yet, but we're getting close, right? Like the, the Mandalorian is a, it's a great crossover moment because for those in film and television, you're looking at the Mandalorian and you're seeing it as a film and television product. I'm in games and real time rendering and I'm looking at it as like they're leveraging a lot of real time uh, tech in order to project, you know, the, the environment spheres onto, uh, you know, the, the actors in the space. And so more and more our two worlds are colliding and overlapping. We always, you know, I've always had an art director that's come from film because we always want to make our games more and more cinematic feeling. So yeah, like our our primary goal is to get as close as we can to the stuff that you know Hubert and those guys create on the regular, but just in a you know in a very confined environment. Yeah, I have something to say about that because you know more and more I think I think at least in the VFX industry. Um, it's uh, well it's undeniable that uh, most of the studios are jumping on the on real real yep. time rendering um sort of uh, technology for multiple reasons you know one of the reasons is probably for fast feedback with client and we're not even talking about you know some of these like crossover hybrid production like mandalorian or lion kings where you can actually set design on a virtual set um, and get instantaneous feedback, which is amazing. Uh, uh, at, at, at least uh, probably the clients are gonna be expecting more and more of this, you know, getting uh, faster, more accurate representation of what the final shot is gonna look like um, instead of being used to seeing steps like, you know, gray shaded layout renders and then, animation renders still gray shaded and slowly jumping into lighting but right now it's possible to get all of that done on the unreal engine and the rendering times are incredibly fast and the results are incredibly impressive right and then you find yourself in the vfx studio environment where you're also battling this sort of how fast can we get feedback versus the quality and we're producing so much stuff now that I guess feedback starts trumping quality a little bit, maybe yeah. on certain productions. Um, and then we have to catch up the game because, uh, you know, the technology and gaming has advanced so much due to the things that, that Michael just mentioned, which is real time feedback, 4K renders, and better and better quality of textures and lighting. Um, 
and simulation and, and geometry and quality of models. So much more, you know, data coming in and being rendered real, real time. And I think the VFX industry was a little bit, you know, uh, was in a comfortable space of being like, oh, we can just render, uh, render overnight and force, brute force it. We don't care how long it takes as long as it renders. And we, you know, we have much more time to 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 uh, you know create something photorealistic, and now we don't have that possibility anymore, or at least uh, less and less so. And then we sort of have to look into gaming, what's happening there, and be like, oh my god, they've been working, they've been busy all these years, <laughs> they're catching up, and yeah. now we're in this space where where. You know, we we have to use these technologies. It's so many technologies come from gaming, at least in the VFX industry. Uh, there are so many uh, technologies that come specifically from gaming and make our lives so much easier, faster. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one and thing scary. There, well, one thing there, uh, I don't know if you've seen the, uh, was it Baymax Dreams? from uh, Pixar. So they took the the property, the Big Hero 6 property, and then they decided to make a series of short films. And they were exploring different technologies and they wanted to kind of play with game stuff. And so the Baymax Dreams shorts are actually uh, animated and rendered inside of the Unity game engine. And right. it was so cool to see the director go up to a lighting artist and say like, oh, well, I want you know the lighting to come from this direction and reset everything. And the director like goes to turn away and the artist is like, oh no, like here. And he just sort of grabs the light, and moves it over. And yeah. So yeah, like that, yeah. the the feedback speed is kind of like it's one of the things that I think is driving that amalgamation of our yeah. you know, our industries. And we can't look past that anymore. You know, yeah. you, you there's a studio that still works you know, in a different way, eventually they're going to have to catch up. Uh, and I'm talking about VFX studios. You have to have that sort of fast feedback right now. Um, uh, you have no choice. Um, so, so this is great. Like it's, you know, we're continuing this discussion. So now while we were on the more tech side, um, I want to talk about Maybe I'll I'll ask Mike first about how do you design kind of a scenario for a game and how would that um, be like what's the difficulty about designing and while it still makes sense and still allow the user to uh, explore the area and and I would say even not just area right like the newest game you probably have the main character can sit there and meditate and then suddenly <laughs> the night turned to day or the day turned to night so you have to make sure lighting kind of works in all circumstances so this is a another good one uh especially i'm you know an old dog in the industry and so i've seen some advancements and we used to just have a time of day when we made a game right it's like okay we're making a nighttime game we're making a daytime game but the demand from the, the players, from the user is more, more, more. And so it's like, okay, well now we've got a day night cycle, right? It's like, so you're gonna play the game and every 10 minutes, it's gonna cycle from day to night, night to day. Um, in terms of lighting and painting with light for video games, the major challenge is if you give the user control of the camera, right? Because if you think about a film, the director takes the camera sets it up somewhere, makes the shot, or does like a dolly or a crane or a boom. You always know where exactly where the light and the camera is going to be at any given time. And in most games, like your Red Dead Redemptions and, you know, any open world thing, you have a daylight, you know, sunlight that's going to come in. How are you going to set the scene? How are you going to set the scenarios? Where are you going to put the, the player or the camera? do you know that they're always going to arrive at that area in daytime or maybe they're going to come here at night right so half of it is going to be intentional and then half of it is going to be iterative right you craft your lighting and then you send it off to quality assurance 
they play the heck out of it. They do unexpected things with it, right? Like they'll they'll be like, oh, you know, our QA guy, he sat around for an hour waiting until it turned nighttime and then he did all the missions at night. And you're like, ah, we didn't design for that, right? So it it's when you can have a set camera, lighting in games is way easier. When, you know, you have uh, let's say like, you know, we have what's known as a cut scene, which is basically a cinematic and you don't have any control. Those are much easier to design for the actual in-game world is, you know, like if, if we're lucky enough to have just a big open world space, you put a sun in the sky and then you, you know, if there's houses, they have lamps or whatever inside, but yeah, it's, it can be quite tricky. It depends on the genre of game, right? Uh, I've been lucky, you know, working on racing games or working on like shooter games, it's mostly an outdoor environment. And a lot of that is driven by either the sunlight or moonlight, some street lamps, that type of stuff. It's not super difficult. Um, you know, things like, like I keep bringing up like, you know, horror games or very specific uh, games that have a lot of indoor environments. They're also tricky. And then also we have a lot of games now that are completely dynamic. Um, like my kids and I play Fortnite. Every single thing inside of that game is destructible, right? How do you plan for every single object in the entire world can be broken and blown up and destroyed by the user? It's kind of tricky to craft stuff like that. I'm glad I haven't had to work on that. <laughs> Yeah. So, and I guess, so for, for Hubert, it's more about, um, so lighting, um, in terms of, you know, like creating the story, like the story, right. How to craft the story and like, where does the design sense come from, uh, for you, uh, right. Is, do you have some stuff that you have to look for? Is there like specific direction from um, uh, either the cinematographer, the director that is? Oh, looking, well, I have that. Know. You know, I have that advantage as opposed to uh, you know uh, Michael's challenges is that I have the advantage of not having to think about it too much. Uh, because I have to match what's been shot on set. And if the on-set cinematography is, wasn't impressive, and it certainly happens, uh, then you're sort of stuck. You have to, you, you're always in this sort of battle. It's like, how do I improve this? But it has to be seamless, right? Uh, going back to my green screen example, uh, it's like, it's never going to yield true outdoor results on a green screen uh, with artificial lights. So then I have to match to that, but then I have to make it photo real. But my foundation isn't photo real. So that's that's the challenge here. And I, I get that challenge also when it comes to like structural material. Sometimes we, you know, let's say do set extensions and everything is very flatly, strongly front lit, let's say not very well you know lighting is not that interesting let's say and then you see that it's a fake styrofoam set and i have to extend it well i i have to match the styrofoam otherwise i'm breaking the illusion that it's extended uh, so then we're in this then well then usually what happens in this situation is that we replace everything right mm -hmm. If that, if that indeed is the direction we want to go into uh, and it doesn't look real because now we're matching to styrofoam then we we, we we end up replacing everything so i guess if if something is well lit on set then i i don't have to think too much i just match that of course when there's a lot of extensions to be done there's a lot of lighting decisions to be to be made let's say for the outside you know you know, is it overcast? Is it not playing in lights and shadows just to create that like simultaneous sort of contrast? Uh, so it, it, your eye sort of moves outside of frame, um, no, it stays inside of frame, but is is pushed forward into the frame. You know, creating the illusion of some sort of depth in the story. But I I rarely have to design 
um, a full environment, mm -hmm. unless it's full ECG. But then there's always an idea from the directors, you know. Uh, uh, and then we 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 were a little bit in the same situation as as Michael explained. It's like, are we daytime or are we nighttime? And throughout the sequence, if we go into nighttime, then then we have to design it accordingly. But we're certainly not in a situation where we have to <laughs> pack all of that into 15 minutes of, of uh, gameplay time. So we don't have that technical restriction, which makes our lives a little bit easier. Um, you know, um, but how do you design? Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> Oh boy! Uh, so uh, I mean, no, this... the answers are a little bit in your in your thumbnails. You uh -huh. like everything backlit, and then everybody <laughs> loves it. Everybody that loves it. That is how you do it. So, uh, Ninety percent of your selected images are backlit, and I think subconsciously you selected them like that because you <laughs> thought they were awesome. So um, if you look at movies, everything is backlit, uh, even though the camera changes one eighty degrees. <laughs> That's, so that's we can do so that in let's Michael uh cannot do that in this gameplay unfortunately yeah <laughs> well so you just mentioned exactly kind of what i want to segue into but i want to make this more about uh instead of like just design is kind of how you think about light and and i will put it this way is how you learn to think about light, right? Is kind of how how you started. Um, what what kind of pitfall you I would say is you encounter when you are uh, maybe matching the light, right? Is what sort of light is uh, kind of mostly mostly missing when you are doing your own, and then where when you compare to some maybe even uh, you can even mention. Uh, some artists that you look at uh, who does a great piece of uh, either a map painting or a game environment that it has all the light that it needs to, it works great, but somehow yours is missing in the beginning when you're uh, just learning. Um, so, so maybe the question is about like, how do you figure out those small details and how do you grow uh, from just learning and then yeah. to become a professional? Yeah, maybe well, Mike, I, I you want to, or Hubert, you want to take it first? Well, I don't know if I understand your question correctly, but I, mm -hmm. I, if, I, if I do, uh, at least from a um, uh, full CG perspective or, or even a painting perspective, um, but full CG is a good example. And let's say you build something full CG from scratch and you spend so much time on textures and modeling and you become attached to these things. And then once you light it, you sort of want to showcase everything that you've done. And all of a sudden you're in the situation that everything is lit and it becomes flat and you become your own worst enemy because you, you, you sort of wanted to showcase all of your beautiful texture work, but the image itself is suffering and the image has to work. But well, the image has to be interesting. Uh, so it, I, I think it's very important to play with light and shadow and not be afraid of that contrast between the two and not be afraid to block certain things even though you spend some time working on them and i think that also happens in movies you know they spend so much money on the set that they want to show it and and you look at some of the some of you know awesome movies uh, you know uh, michael was mentioning like horror movies which are, are very much my jam but you look at some of the lighting in like the first alien and it, 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 as far as everybody's concerned it could have been just painted one color no one sees anything and everything makes sense and the mood is there and you just play with that positive and negative space and it's so um uh, and it's so awesome and it works and you don't have to showcase what you've done and uh, everything is sculpted with lighting and and you know where to look you know where not to look and the rest just your mind fills in the blanks um, so playing with that dark and light 
for me, I, I sort of like that contrast. Of course, certain projects cannot be like that, obviously, for whatever uh, you know narrative reasons. But I certainly like that. I'm gra gravitating towards that, and I think the human eye gravitates to, towards that contrast as well. That's why backlit images are the ones that we usually do. Mike? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's, yeah, echoing a, a lot of what Hubert was saying. Um, with us on the, the game side, one of the major pitfalls for young people or artists that are, you know, just learning is that most game engines and, you know, Maya, Blender, 3 Studio Max, they all have the default lighting environment. And it's there to help you as a modeler. It's there to help you as an animator, but it definitely does not help you as a lighting artist because the default lighting in most of those scenarios is set up to just be very medium, very, you know, fill everywhere. And so it's not going to create any dramatic moods. It's not going to create any scenes. It's just there to help, you know, a sculptor sculpt or an animator animate. So one of the first things you gotta do is kind of take it back to basics, right? Like remove the, the default lights in the scene and start crafting your own. Uh, the other tricky thing for us in the game space is you must never make the user feel cheated. They must never feel like, you know, like they got killed because some bad thing was there by design. You always have to keep things fair. And so in so doing, that fights with the, the lighting and the design because sometimes you wanna paint really dark shadows or you wanna paint really hard highlights. And if you do that, you can create you know blind spots or areas that are unfair to the user. So we kind of have to learn to sort of walk in between those lines. You gotta make it realistic looking enough to be believable but you also have to keep it fair enough that you don't cheat the user, right? Like not every game can be Dark Souls. Not every game can be very punishing. You have to, you know, kind of hold the, the player's hand from time to time and show them what they're supposed to be doing. So I think for the game space, it's a little bit trickier when you are working in an interactive medium where you're going to have angry users. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can have angry film critics, you can have angry viewers at movies, but a jump scare in a horror movie is awesome. A jump scare in a video game, if it results in player death, you know, nine times out of 10, they're going to get really bored of it really easily. And then they're going to stop playing a game. And then worst thing is they're going to give you that review bomb, right? They're going to go onto Steam or meta and just be like, this game is crap, you know, it's totally unfair, that sort of stuff. So we we kind of have to take the, the artistry and blend it with gameplay. You have to balance both. Perfect. So, and I think what you mentioned uh, initially is, I think it's it's almost like a cautionary tale is, right, be aware of what's already given, right, as kind of the baseline. So, so one of the, a very interesting exercise, I believe, that artists been doing for many, many years, uh, starting just from uh, like hundreds of years ago, uh, just painters in general, thinking about painting the light, uh, the night and night, right? Painting the light and night. So, and it's always tricky because um, in a sense, our eyes are doing a lot of dynamic adjusting um, throughout so kind of setting a nice thing is never, uh, it never feels realistic in some sense or the other. So my question is, how do you, how do you guys like to light the night, right? Mm -hmm. Is, do you have any trick on matching uh, the color at night, matching the, the brightness at night while making it, uh, believable, but also practical. I mean, I'll, I'll jump in just because we just did basically this assignment. 
uh, one of my assignments is a nighttime lighting assignment. And we do go in and we do set all the lights and we get everything feeling just so, and it never really looks great until we start pushing a lot of post-processing. <laughs> yeah. Post-process is the thing that brings all of nighttime in video games to life. Uh, you know, forcing bloom, uh, messing with uh, color saturations, uh, crunching, you know, shadows and stuff like that. I can, you know, I take all the, the students into Unreal and I show them the, the lighting setup and we've got neons and we've got signs and we've got billboards and all sorts of like, you know, fun animating stuff. And it looks okay. And then you bring in all the posts, you bring in color correction, you bring yeah. in, you know, uh, lens flares, depths of field, and you start crafting it. And all of a sudden it starts to look a little bit closer and a little bit closer to that target. So, I mean, the light itself is the most important thing, but it's that last 10% polish that comes from uh, the post that gives it everything like in in games in general like you'll find that you'll be working on a game working on a game and you're like kind of concerned because it's not looking super great and then it starts to tighten up around the time when the lighting artist comes in and starts to tune it and adds some post and gets it gets it feeling good because i'm just i'm looking at that shot right there with like the vogue and the comfort in and all that stuff there and yeah like we kind of recreated a shot like that and it's it's really tricky to get it with just raw lighting. It's it's very difficult to emulate nighttime because especially uh, in camera stuff, when you get like slightly long exposure times, then you get that little bit of streaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you get the, the chromatic aberration where you start to get like the red, greens and blues starting to separate a little bit, you can't get that purely in camera in Unreal. But if you just turn on the post and just start tweaking some of the values, you can start to, to dial that stuff in. Yeah, well, the same thing in VFX renderers, right? They don't come straight off the bo box. You have to post-process everything in, in like, uh, like a Nuke uh, software and start adding all of these camera effects. But I think that, that we're in this weird situation, you know, uh, philosophical discussion of what is real night time um, <laughs> yep. are we matching to what the eye sees and the eye is very dynamic so wherever you see is going to be different and it's going to just <laughs> well dynamically change or are we matching to something that's tone mapped and when we're talking about tone mapping we're talking about this post process and same thing goes to photography, same thing goes to movie making. And then you're in this weird world of, am I matching reality or am I matching my impression of what it should be? And, and I guess we're in this like sort of weird visual language of we're used to seeing photography and photography most of the time, nighttime photography has been post-processed or is overexposed or long exposure. So creates these sort of weird cinematic artifacts, which the eye does not see, but we're used to seeing. And now video games are in, are trying to match that obviously, because as far as the viewer thinks, this is reality, which it really isn't. This is photographic reality. Uh, this is post-processed tone mapped nighttime reality. This is not what the eye sees. But then you want to sell it as photo real. Well, that's what it is. It's photo real. It's not really real. And then I guess in nighttime photography, at least in movie making, then you get these two things, at least from my experience. Then you get real, realistic nighttime uh, cinematography, which you don't see very often, or you get the superhero Hollywood cinematography at nighttime, which is impossible to see in real life so it's a uh, day for night weird skies you know these you know marvel skies batman skies uh, you know that's what you used to see most of the time and the viewer is just used to seeing that as being the status quo of what nighttime photography is 
And now a lot of people have to sort of match it because that's what people think is supposed to look like. And uh, I find that, well, I find that annoying a lot of times, uh, I personally, um, because Great. at nighttime, everything is dark. <laughs> and <laughs> no, and no, it's, sometimes it's, it's nice I, to keep it like that. Uh, I, I want to uh, dive a little deeper on the word annoying because uh, um, I want to ask you, more of um, a direct question of your preference. Okay, so maybe you very can kind of talk about your preferences as an artist. Do you want more naturalistic? Do you want it to, uh, I guess, emulate the dynamic range of our eyes a little bit more? Or do you want it to be more designed, right, pushed to uh, push the contrast, push the the range of what the lighting is in um, a scene, and maybe maybe even talk about uh, the benefit of pushing either way. Yeah, depends on the story, I guess. Right, the story has to drive it. You know, everything comes from the story, and that's how it is. But sometimes I feel like at least in movies, maybe it's a little bit pushed just for, um, for the sake of, um, uh, for the sake of being cool, maybe something like that. Or, and then you lose a little bit of that. Um, maybe uh, everything starts looking a little bit the same. And I can say the same thing about design, uh, lighting or design of objects or sci-fi design. You know, we're sort of used to a certain language and it's easy to gravitate, to gravitate towards that, that because that's what we're used to seeing more and more. And then we get into that feedback loop of we see even more of it, so we expect even more of that. And before you know it, everything looks the exact same thing. And and something comes in that's, that's some sort of breaks through to the uh, through the through the you know through the, through the same old same old and everybody gravitates towards it. It's like oh my god, it's so original. And you see that in gaming, and you see that in movies, and and it is right. And you're like oh my god, how come we waited so long for something like this? Uh, it's so awesome, and that happens a lot in movies and probably a lot of games as well. Trying to break from that same old. Um, I don't know. I personally like in movies. I can't say it really depends on the story, but I, I really gravitate towards natural soft lighting. I have a lot of examples that I've seen lately, which were just so cool and worked so well uh, in movies. Um, and it was just beautiful to watch and it just made sense. And it was so pleasing to the eye. Um, but yeah. Do you, do you want to point at any specific film that you particularly enjoyed? Well, natural lighting, like I'm talking about natural light, so mm -hmm. not much artificial light has been introduced in the movie. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe one of the, I don't know, maybe I can, it was uh, The King, The King, that was a cool film. Maybe I'll message them here. Maybe I'll find the links and paste them here. Why not? Why not? The King was very cool. So I, I forget what the cinematographer's name was. Um, but just nice and soft lighting. Mm -hmm. um, let me paste a couple. Uh, I'll try to look for them. Maybe Michael can take over. But Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I very much agree with you there, like in terms of the the game the genre everything is going to drive the look and much like hollywood we see a lot of cycles we see a lot of like one game will come out with a very particular advancement in you know its look or its rendering and then you start to get a lot of not so much copycats but you will see the proliferation of that technique or style um I myself, I've always worked on games that were attempting to be photorealistic, not natural lighting. So like when I came into games, I was working on the Neve Speed franchise. 
uh, Fast and the Furious had come out. And so what all we were trying to do was like jump on board that, you know, nighttime street racing trend, uh, you know, neons everywhere, over the top. Wet ground, you know, right? Yeah, like just over the top <laughs> stuff. Um, after a few years of working on that, and that's another thing, like in games, like I worked on the same franchise for pretty much a decade. So like every year it's make cars go fast, make cars go fast. Hmm. By about the third year of it, you know, we had gotten to the point where we were making a nighttime game and then we would switch over cadence and make a daytime game the next year because we wanted to change up the look, make it somehow differentiate itself. Uh, it got to the point where we even tried to make kind of like a simulation racing game. When we went to go and make a simulation racing game, it's a totally different ball game for lighting because you're trying to now capture, you know, what is it really like to drive a car as opposed to what is it like to fake drive a street racing car? Mm -hmm. And, you know, even the like moments where you're in a tunnel and then your eyes dynamically adjust to coming out of the tunnel, you get that like moment where the light washes over you. That's like a, a cool moment and a cool effect. And it's very naturalistic. But I mean, like I've worked on Battlefield and Battlefield is supposed to be like this sort of realistic looking shooter. But again, the particular entry into the franchise that I worked on, they were very concerned with the single player game and they wanted it, you know, larger than life. And so again, we're pushing larger than life lighting. Uh, I worked on Sleeping Dogs, which was like a, a GTA style game, but set in Hong Kong. And again, Hong Kong, we were pushing more neon, more like a caricature of Hong Kong, right? And so when you caricature something, you're gonna take it and you're gonna blow it out. So most of the stuff that I've been involved with has been the, the artificial lighting scene. Um, I don't have anything against it, but I'm, you know, just like you bear, like I play a bunch of open world games. Like, you know, um, I was playing The Witcher and, some of the other open worlds like GTA, stuff like that. And specifically with GTA, there's a whole bunch of mods that have been made just called like the real life mod, right? And what they're doing is they are trying to get that rendering away from the video gamey look and taking it as close as possible to real world lighting. And there's some really great stuff that people have done with that. And also uh, Spider-Man. The Spider-Man game for PS4 and now PS5 has like its recreation of a you know pretty good chunk of New York, and it's all outdoor lighting, but it is Marvel, and so you're getting a lot of pushed over the top lighting in that game. But cinematically, like utterly fantastic, fantastic game, beautiful, beautiful uh, rendering inside of it. Um, in terms of really cool, naturalistic lighting, uh, I don't know if you guys have played The Last of Us or Last of Us 2. It came mm -hmm. out, uh, I think it was last year. I can't. Mm -hmm. My brain for the last year and a half has not been so great with tracking time. So, <laughs> But Last of Us 2 was really good at creating a fairly you know, true-to-life lighting experience. Um, they weren't even really going for true photorealism in terms of the graphical fidelity. But in terms of the lighting environment, I think they really nailed it. It's a little bit grittier and it's a little bit closer to, you know, it's not full saturation. There's a little bit of desaturation in their colors and it just feels good. I mean, the game is gritty and you do a lot of bad things in it, but in terms of the the look, it's a really fun game. Yeah, and, and I just like to uh, adding uh, a very... Uh... I would say an interesting story, like or almost like a cautionary tale for I guess the listener here is. So we had a student, right, and we're we're just looking at photographs. So essentially, we went out, took a bunch of photographs, and we count we we come back in, right? We look at the photographs, and and the first image was an image of just the street scene and the sky, and the sky is just way. Uh, overexposed, blown out. And then we asked the student, right, does the sky look like that? And the student answered, yep, that's what school, sky looks like because 
that happened on every single photo on his cell phone, mm. for example. <laughs> so it's almost like that almost took over his experience of real sky mm. uh, in a sense. So we're, I think with the adv advancement of all our uh, technology, right? Our sense of reality or what is a naturalistic lighting uh, might blend into the virtual reality uh, even. Um, mm. It's, uh, I'm not saying uh, which way right, is right or wrong. I'm just saying it's an observation of kind of people's understanding of uh, what is naturalistic in a sense that even that can shift. Um, so uh, we are uh, approaching the end uh, of our discussion. So I like to end on uh, kind of a forward facing topic is kind of the future of the lighting. And, uh, and this is where uh, please speculate all you want is kind of maybe even something that we don't even have right now that you might look forward to having right at your disposal when uh, creating any kind of uh, art. Um, Mike, you want to start that one? Sure. I mean, for me, I just want true real time lighting, right? I don't want to wait for anything. Um, <laughs> when it comes to ray tracing, like that is a very lovely buzzword that gets thrown around a lot real-time, real-time ray tracing, all that sort of stuff. We are not quite there yet, right? If you want true real-time ray tracing, we're talking like probably another five to 10 years of hardware in order to be able to compute enough rays being cast to give us true real-time ray tracing. Um, what we have now is ray tracing, but it only is allowing it to bounce one or two times before the ray is running out of steam. And that's not really how real light works. So we're getting closer, but we're not there. And I want to be able to throw a light in the scene and see what it does properly. Um, you know, right now in games, we still have either real-time lights, which are very expensive, or we have what are known as baked lights, right? So we can bake a light so we can render it ahead of time so that we don't have to calculate it at runtime. But that sucks because that light is now static and it's taken out of the equation. So if the player moves around, that light's not really doing what it's supposed to. The real-time light is great, but it's more expensive. You know, you put a whole bunch of real-time lights close together and all of a sudden there's a huge performance hit. So my dream future for lighting is just a place where it just works. Um, <laughs> The future right now, like I've been playing with the Unreal 5 uh, sort of like alpha that they've released. It's gorgeous and we're getting close. But again, I think we're still hardware limited. So I, I really want to get there because it would just be so nice to, instead of teaching students about technical limitations, I would like to teach them as though it was just purely cinematography. It's purely like, put lights in scene, see what they do, play with them, as opposed to like put lights in scene, press the button to build, wait, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's that's my, my dream for lighting is just, you know, you jump into the game engine and it just does what you want it to do. I think that that would unlock a lot for students and even for professionals, you know, um, one of the cool things with 3D is, you know, you can do stuff with lights that you can't physically do in the real world or would be prohibitively expensive in the real world. Some of the real world lighting rigs are, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Or you just go into the Unreal and you go, oh, I want, you know, I want a point light over here and I want a spotlight over there and I want a volume light over here. And then you don't like it, delete, 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 right? So I just, I, I want to democratize lighting and make it you know, just no barrier for entry. That's that's my my dream wish list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Hubert, what do you what do you think? I'm thinking about it. I mean, I mean, what, what Michael says sounds great, and I want some of that as well. Yeah, I would have to say, you know, um, um, 
I don't know what the future of lighting might be. You know, I'm, I'm coming a little bit more from the, you know, once again, linked to that camera sort of experience. And, you know, it seems like right now we're pushing technology just to be more resolution, more dynamic range. And that gives us much more power to play around with the image. And as much as that gives us a lot more control over the final look of an image, maybe sometimes we start breaking things. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit tricky. It's, a, it's very easy to touch these dials and start going crazy. Uh, and then forget that we're, we're trying to tell a story and then we're sort of maybe working against it sometimes, um, depending on of course, on the design of the story and that what works, but I don't know what the future of lighting might be. Um, I don't know, especially not in camera. But, so you're not for speculation, not yet. Well, I can speculate on some, some sort of ideas. Okay. It would yeah. be great to have cameras that uh, as, as they take pictures, they also real-time LiDAR scan. Yeah. So I have a which is which is coming along i guess especially mm -hmm. with that sort of live tracking and live sort of face recognition so and and virtual reality you know games and stuff like that but uh, pushing that quality so it's much more accurate lifetime frame by frame uh, model uh, polygon generation uh, alongside with the picture quality of course and then you have control over over relighting if you so wish so if if, if possible uh, you know you can probably <clears throat> light your set as flat as possible so as ambient and flat as possible and you'd have a very high quality mesh that matches frame by frame you project that and you do all your lighting design on your footage inside on the inside a machine placing digital lights over a uh, practical uh, sort of um, footage yeah that would be fun and to play around with and uh, i mean once again you get so much control that the results would be quite funky but it'd be fun to see what people come up with that right so, yeah and and i think there's a topic we didn't quite cover and it's kind of unfortunate Tarek didn't join us because he is actually actively studying this is uh, the role of machine learning that plays into right. all of this, right? That's kind of where uh, future of lighting will be very heavily influenced by uh, machine learning for sure. Uh, and so the, my final question for you guys will be uh, to uh, give kind of the students or even artists here uh, kind of one of the suggestions you would, you know, you would recommend them to uh, maybe learn about something specific or pay attention to, like what is kind of the one suggestion you would uh, tell the students that is coming to a, a school learning about all these kind of fundamental principles. Um, and before you answer that, right, yeah, I'll have you guys to think about it is I'll ask the, uh, the audience here is, if you have any questions uh, right now, is now is the time to ask it. Uh, is you can type it into the Q and A or type in the chat box. Um, and when uh, Hubert and Michael finish answering that question, uh, we will come around and answer those questions. And but if there's no um, too much uh, questions in the chat, uh, we'll we'll just wrap up the uh, discussion there. All right, mm -hmm. so. Uh, who's, who wants to start? Is it Michael? Yeah. Sure. Um, number one thing I tell all students, whether you're interested in lighting or rendering or modeling or whatever, is when you're starting out and you're learning, always work from a piece of reference, right? Like, you know, especially if there is an image that you can get that you know a lot about. Like, if you know, you know, uh, the lens. Uh, focal distance, anything, any information that you can glean about your, your reference image, then you can start to recreate that in the engine, in the, the editor. Um, 
again, this is something that I have my students do is we, we grab a piece of reference, you know, just a random image online that they select and we start building out the lighting in order to attempt to uh, recreate that as closely as possible. It's great because then it also exposes kind of the, the pitfalls, the things that you don't understand. And then that sparks conversation because then they're gonna come to you and ask like, how do I achieve this? Why can't I get this, right? So reference, reference, reference. That's the name of the game when it comes to, to learning something is learn from reality, learn from an image. Nice. No, absolutely. And we even, even in the professional field, I noticed that we forget about that constantly. And then we're struggling with something and then you realize it was all coming from our imagination all along and nobody bothered to gather at least five pieces of reference, uh, make a contact sheet and share it with the team, right? And be like, this is what rocks in Southern Italy look like, right? Uh, yeah. Or something. Uh, so we forget and we struggle and we think that we have so many powerful things under our fingertips, which we do. Uh, but then we, we think we can just uh, scroll uh, sliders in, you know, all the way into the final result. And it's like, come on, let's think about it a little bit more with references. And, and yeah, we tend to forget that. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I have one thing maybe to mention is at least for for my field, I, I feel like since since everybody has cameras on in their cell phones and a collection of Instagram filters, uh, we sort of tend to forget how to do photography, even though everybody does photography. So that sort of um, field has been so diluted, and it's such a shame. So you know, uh, and and cameras on our cell phones become better and better and that's great but we sort of forget about the fundamentals of photography even though everybody takes pictures which is ironic so uh, at least for lighter lighting and well the effects i think everybody should be into photography to a certain degree and i don't mean instagram um i mean you know some sort of even the cheap dslr or now these Sony's mirrorless Sony's are so great. And, yeah. um, think more about lenses. You can think more about f-stops, ISO, long time exposure. Some of these things will, which will then feed into post processing and and Lightroom or even on your camera or any other sort of software. And then you get into that world of what am I seeing versus what is the lens seeing. And if the lens is seeing that, is that my story? Am I looking at the story through a lens or am I telling a story through my human eyes? And then you'll probably realize that our visual language is very lens-based. Uh, but yeah, photography maybe. Perfect. That's that. no that that's that's a great uh, follow-up point. And, and and I think it's it's almost hard to see, you know, from uh, just everyday you know, everyday life, it's you're kind of hard to see, right? You have this tool and then you think the tool is the solution, right? Mm -hmm. It's sometimes it's, it's actually adding more question on top, uh, which brings us to questions. So we have three uh, very good question is, so we'll have Sar uh, ask, is learning optics in physics important for lighting? So any of, any one of you can answer that, maybe. We touched base on that in 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 in, in our foundation class that I teach. Uh, so we touch base on that, and obviously, I don't have a background in physics, but understanding how it works and understanding the difference between the eye and the lens is quite important for perspective layout, um, building a three D environment uh, for a game or for. A, VFX and then storytelling through a lens and what is our visual uh, reference? What is our visual language? Uh, so, and then optics and physics. Yeah, I guess so to a certain degree. Mike, do you have a follow up or? Uh, I mean, similar story. Uh, again, in terms of understanding the, the physical properties of light, it's going to give you or go a long way to enable you to recreate it, right? If you 
if you struggle with thinking about you know light and physics it's it's not a, a hugely difficult thing it's just knowing that light just doesn't terminate when it hits something right like it it travels it continues it bounces so in terms of for us in games again anything that you have any knowledge that you have that is somehow you know relevant even if it's like tangentially relevant is going to assist you in learning right if you if you're coming to this with a photography background, it's hugely beneficial. Uh, again, like, you know, uh, having an actual camera as opposed to your phone is a, a perfect example because you actually think about kind of what you're doing a little bit more. Um, you know, the, the phones are fantastic with the, the point and shoot stuff, but understanding how lighting works. I mean, anybody who has a phone and shoots at night will immediately understand physics of lighting because those tiny little sensors inside of your phone are nowhere near as useful as your eyeballs, right? Every time like I've tried to take a photo at night with my phone, I just stop trying because <laughs> it's incapable of capturing the, the scene that's in front of us. Except for that new impressive iPhone 5 or whatever it is, that's <laughs> some piece of machinery. Yeah. Or, but or then, ne yeah. next year's yeah. model right it will, it will, yeah. but uh and and uh, i mean like photography is such a such a huge topic and infinitely interesting and and i will even add to that even for daytime is if you look deeper into yeah. just the camera sensors right between different uh camera is when they use different sensors some of their color science uh are different so they don't even when you think everything is the same, maybe even just the reds that's not matching against each other probably doesn't even match to what you're seeing. So, um, yeah, there's it's a whole different world kind of to dive into. So it's a great place to start, by the way, because everybody has a phone, has a camera, can see the difference, ask that question. Okay, and so the second question, uh, so forgive me if I pronounce thing incorrectly, is Fron, is what are some of the sought after software and render engines for lighting, like Maya and Arnold? Question. My phone? I don't know. I use Maya and Arnold and I love it. It's great. <laughs> it's easy I mean, to use. Yeah. All, all of the rendering that I do is real time. Uh, Unreal is fantastic in terms of, you know, the, the render quality that you can get. You can do some pretty impressive 4K rendering direct in the engine. You can export videos, movies, stills, you know, you can, you can export uh, renders in passes just like in film and then you can composite it in Nuke or wherever you want. So, it, I mean, you can render out, you know, in Arnold or Redshift or any number, you can use Maya's, you know, uh, built-in renderer, whatever the scan line. But the the end of the day is, you know, art direction, right? Um, mm -hmm. if, if, if you can do it in Unreal and turn it around in 10 minutes or so, and it is acceptable by your art director, then that's probably going to be the direction that you're going in. If you need that, you know, Toy Story 4 hyper, you know, realistic PBR where you can see the, the dust particles hanging in the spider webs, that might not be rendered in Unreal, you know, like RenderMan taking eight hours is probably what's required to hit that visual fidelity target. So, um, if you're just, you know, learning and uh, you want to get some really cool stuff on the go, I even recommend just get Blender, right? Uh, Blender has the cycles renderer for offline rendering for, uh, you know, just renders that take longer. It also has a built-in real-time environment called Eevee. And Eevee's renderer has, again, grown by leaps and bounds. It's chomping at the heels of cycles in terms of its quality bar and it turns it around quite quickly. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, the, the shot or the visual is more important than the software behind it. So I, I hope that helps. 
Nice. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think that the blended questions of SARS as a follow up. So that probably answer your question, SARS. It's uh, blended could be a very good learning tool, right? Um, so, Sir John asks Should we always match the scene according to the reference we have? Or do we have to find other references that we want our scene lighting to be? The good old switch we do, right? If you can match the reference, find a reference that matches your render. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Is that what you mean, Sir Chan? Hi, Sir Chan. How are you? Uh, I don't know. I've done that in the past. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I mean, the reference is supposed to be your visual guideline, right? It's not supposed to be copied uh, 100%, at least not to my understanding. You know, we borrow a lot, but we, 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 we don't steal. You know, we're borrowing, borrowing, and getting inspired. But we're not stealing. Uh, but, you know, certainly when you work on something, you get yourself a contact sheet with uh, six, seven, eight, ten references uh, of the mood you're trying to recreate from movies or pictures online. And you're trying to let that guide you, but you're looking at how dense are the shadows, what colors are my lights, uh, how exposed is the sky. Uh, and then, and then you slowly funnel down to your specific design, uh, but you try not to copy something 100%, I think. Mm -hmm. inspired. Yeah, I think like the, the phrase, you know, artwork is never finished, it's abandoned, right? Like when you're working from a reference and you reach a certain point where, you know, you've, you're injecting your own artistry on top of it and you're getting pretty close to your, your reference point, I think that, you know, at that point you need to be able to kind of like let it go. Um, and then going back to what I was saying before, what does your art director think, <laughs> right? Mm. If the art director walks by and says, it needs more of this or it needs more of that, then follow their direction. I just wanted to add a little bit for the, somebody that was asking about if Blender is industry standard. Uh, in games, the entire like Ubisoft as an, as an entity has completely switched from Maya to Blender as their content creation tool. Uh, they're also using it for uh, film. Uh, Ubisoft is making a TV series right now where it's all being done in Blender as well. Yep. Uh, I've got friends all throughout the industry where the studio now doesn't really care about the tool as much, especially since it's not part of the rendering pipeline. The engine does all the rendering, so they don't care if you're modeling in a different package or, you know, creating textures in a different package they don't care yeah i can i can uh, echo that for sure i've heard of loads of studios using that and well, if the tool is available in your toolbox in that specific company then as long as everybody's happy with the result it doesn't really matter what you're doing and what you're using and i know rodeo for a fact is using blender as well and their results are amazing yeah. So, yeah. so, so the the trick is uh, the magic is not in the tool, right? Yeah. The magic is in the artist. Um, all right. So, with that, uh, we shall uh, conclude uh, today's uh, little discussion about lighting. Um, I hope everyone enjoy this little discussion and right have something to take home to think about. Uh, if you have a question about the school, uh, you can email uh, programs at the CEA.ca or you can email directly to the Walker. Uh, he also left his uh, contact info uh, earlier is dgandhi at the CEA.ca. So uh, please, right, if you have a question, right, regarding programs, the school, etc., uh, you can email there. Uh, otherwise, stay tuned. Uh, we'll definitely uh, aim to have more discussion like this, right? And huge thanks to uh, our panelists. Thank you guys for Thank uh, you guys. participating. Thanks for having us. Yeah.
All right, everybody. Uh, have a good day and uh, have a good week.